responsibility of this man to his family and to the cause of Christ uh, many times that I kept going. So I want you to lift your voice and make some noise for the legendary Damon Thompson as he comes, everybody. Thank you, dude. Love you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Man. Good. We on? We on? We on? We on? All right. Noah is the tenth of the antediluvian patriarchs. He's the first descendant of Adam to never know Adam. Noah is able to rescue humanity in captivity by way of an absence of a consciousness of Adam. Every believer in the world believes in the law of imputation. The problem is most only believe in what Adam imputed. And we fail to fully recognize that righteousness was imputed to a people by way of Jesus. And so we are now beginning to come more and more deeply into the revelation of what it means when the scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin, that I through him might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Noah builds the first altar. Corey taught us that just a moment ago. Noah builds the first altar. Noah builds the first altar after he saves humanity by way of spending 80 to 120 years building something only seven other people were interested in. By current evangelical standards, Noah was an absolute failure. Who would spend a minimum of 80 years of their life building something only eight people, seven not including yourself, were interested in being a part of? Somebody who understood that eight is enough as long as all of the seed necessary for planetary regeneration is present within the eight. We would look at the life of Noah according to current evangelical standards and we would call him an absolute utter failure. But I believe what Noah did was Noah rescues a planet by way of rescuing one family at the time. God gives Noah very specific instructions on how the ark is to be constructed and no specific instructions on how to regenerate the planet. And I think what we're looking for, is, especially in the current leadership model, is we're looking for blueprints and we're failing to recognize that intimacy is still the blueprint. Yeah. Noah saves the planet, builds an altar, and plants a vineyard. Corey didn't mention that. He's a Nazarite. So... <laughs> Noah builds an altar, plants a vineyard. He, let's give him a break. He's been on a boat filled with animals and in-laws. <laughs> he plants a vineyard. He overindulges in the vineyard. He's naked, drunk, laying in a tent. The Bible's not boring. Fortnite is boring. Okay. <laughs> so, so. I felt the spirit of offense. Or, that may have been the spirit of murder. I'm not sure what that felt, but I felt it. So he plants a vineyard. He drinks from the vineyard. He is then intoxicated in the vineyard. He's got three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Ham goes into the tent. The Bible says he sees his father's nakedness. That word there means to stare intently as with desire. He sees his father's nakedness. The Bible says Noah wakes up and realizes what had been done to him. I don't know what had been done to him, but something had been done to him. It was offensive enough that Noah wakes up and says, not cursed be Ham, cursed be Canaan. Who is Canaan? Canaan is the son of Ham, the grandson of Noah. One generation's compromise becomes the next generation's captivity. Noah doesn't say cursed be Ham, Noah says cursed be Canaan. third of the earth, third of the present 
earth belongs to Ham, a third belongs to Shem, a third belongs to Japheth, the third that belongs to Ham is now under a curse. Before there was a land named Canaan, there was a family named Canaan that was fathered by a man by the name of Canaan that is functioning in a curse because of the perversion of a previous generation. If you and I do not, by grace and the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus, inherit a necessary transgenerational consciousness, we will continue to waste our lives in self-indulgence and call it prosperity. Cursed be Canaan. Now, if I say to you now, Canaan, the first thing you would think is the promised land. How did we get from Canaan being the land that principally initially represented a curse to now primarily and fundamentally rep Canaan land? The we call it the promised land, but that's not how it started. It started as a curse until a second man came and built an altar. First man builds an altar, his name's Noah. This is exactly what Corey, I don't have any, no, I didn't come to preach it. I got all kind of good stuff, maybe next time. This, this man named Corey Russell stirs something in me. A second man by the name of Abram builds an altar. He hears the word of the Lord say to him, get away from your family and your kinsmen and go to the land that I'll show you. He does not initially identify the land because the land is still principally identified as cursed. He leaves the land he's familiar with, goes on a journey. After he's gone too far to turn around, the Lord said, guess where we're going? Right into the teeth of the curse. See, we have so elevated the nature of our adversary by way of the decrease in the revelation of the nature of our God that we actually are intimidated by the very degrees of darkness we have been assigned to light up with the goodness of God. Light is never intimidated by a degree of darkness. You and I are. I can prove it to you. What measure of faith do you have for healing when you hear stage one? Then what measure of faith do you have for healing when you hear stage four? You know what that is? It's a degree of darkness. Light is never intimidated by the degree of darkness, and Yahweh has been leading a company of seekers on a journey, not so that we could get together and enjoy another awesome feeling on a Saturday morning, but we were designed to invade the darkness with a degree of light for which it cannot be extinguished. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Corey said, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. By Him were all things made. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined forth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not the light, but sent to bear witness of the light, saying, I am not he, but there is one coming after me who's mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to latch it. I baptize you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse 14, Christian, oh, and the word. Did you hear him this morning? Did you hear this man this morning? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the beauty of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What, what is the, what's the point? How do we, do we release a dimension and degree of light that darkness cannot extinguish? Light becomes more than intellectual verbalization. That is not the gospel. I want to fix some thinking in the culture that is worshiping at an academic altar of intellectualism. And believe me, I worshiped at that altar myself for too many years. 
I studied about a God I'd never seen face to face. And it fueled a pride and a hypocrisy in me that I thought if I knew enough about him, it would make up for how afraid I was of him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It's not a conference, it's a lifestyle. It's not a church you attend on Sunday morning, it's a lifestyle. Corey said God's setting us free from Sunday morning Christianity, and he's inviting us to dive headlong into the real thing. In him was life, and the life was the light. The life was the light, and the life and light shined forth into the darkness, and the darkness was unable to extinguish it. Could it be that our life, our light, has been so easily extinguished because it's not been a secondary consequence of a necessary degree of life? You want to come to a conference, you want to get a t-shirt, you want to get a bracelet, you want to get a... Let's be honest, just, we want a selfie with Derek. I want a selfie. With, I'm too ashamed and embarrassed. Corey wants one too, so see, let everything be confirmed in the mouth of two witnesses. If you have no shame, I have no shame. I have no social media. I don't have Facebook. I don't have Instachat or whatever it is. I have none. I've never, I've never logged, on, logged on to Facebook in my life. I won't use it. I will hang it in my office, but I will not use it for more self-promotion. You need the lifestyle. I pray that God makes this event a seed. This could be so much more than a happening. This could be so much more than something you keep the stub or the lanyard. This could become the first fruits of a revolution where people begin to say yes, not to the event, but to the lifestyle. To the lifestyle. So my prayer is that what the event is doing is the event is granting permission for people to begin to say yes to the lifestyle. You got one altar built by the man named Noah, plants a vineyard, has a son by the name of Ham operating in perversion that brings a curse on the next generation called Canaan. It would be a lot easier to follow if I went with what I actually plan on preaching. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> Get another man by the name of Abram gets sent to a land called Canaan, gets to the land called Canaan, and you know what the first thing he finds there? A famine in the land. I must, you know, we're charismatic, so that would have meant we missed God. Because it's supposed to all be so freaking easy. I don't have any hair standing up on the back of my neck. I don't have, <laughs> I didn't get there and they roll out the red carpet. God sent him into the curse. Because he knew the answer for the world around Abram was the world within Abram. The answer to the world around us is the world within us. And instead of focusing on just trying to reach the world around us, what if we cultivated the world within us until life became the light of men and the light shined forth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness could not extinguish it. Abram goes into Canaan. There's a famine there. He goes down to Egypt. This is all in the Bible, I promise. He goes down to Egypt by way of famine, and the first thing that happens is bridal identification is sacrificed. Sarah's my sister. Abram's wife, just like mine, is smoking hot. She really is. My wife really is. Yes. Father, I thank you. Oh, I don't... I don't know. I don't know. It's back, thank you, Corey. Back on track. <clears throat> he says, tell them you're my sister. See, whenever you and I move away from that that we've been intended to reverse, that, that we were pre-designed, what happens is a sacrifice of bridal identification. What happens when bridal identification is lost, so is intimacy. And now that that belonged to Abram, Abram's bride is about to be given over to an adversary because rather than reversing the curse, he ran from it.
I don't know how much to say about what I'm feeling right now, but I think this is a real witness of the suburban movement of the church. I did a six-week revival in New Orleans. We were able to be so blessed to see so many thousands of people come to the Lord, be healed. It's an amazing time. And I would tell preacher friends of mine, God, God, I mean, my inerrancy dudes, my guys, my, my guys who actually believe this stuff, that I was in New Orleans and they would say things to me like, ooh, I, I went there one time and it just felt gross, so I left. I said, you should have bought a condo. God, help us not to run from the places that feel gross, but to receive grace to reverse the curse, the boat, the boat, the boat with all the necessary seed for planetary regeneration comes to rest on Mount Ararat. Corey told us this morning, it means the curse is reversed. Noah has a father by the name of Lamech. He interestingly has a great grandfather by the name of Enoch. Enoch has a son by the name of Methuselah. Methuselah has a son by the name of Lamech, and Lamech has a son by the name of Noah. Enoch, the man who became the devotional standard that walks with God until he's taken away, actually births the longest legacy in history, Methuselah. Could devotional fascination cause revival this time not to be short-term? Could, could an Enoch birth a Methuselah that births a Lamech that births a Noah. This is so interesting. I don't know if it's interesting to you. It's super interesting to me. <laughs> Noah is named Noah by his father Lamech, and this is what the Bible says. In the, in the list of the genealogies, only one person is given description beyond the na their name and the length of time they lived, and it's Noah. For Noah's father Lamech named him Noah and said, Surely this one will bring us relief from the curse. Christianity is not enduring the curse until the trumpet sounds. Biblical Christianity is not you escaping hell and waving goodbye to all the evildoers that did not get the get out of hell card. Biblical Christianity is to look at the curse and say, I was born for such a time as this. Oh! You want to know what God thinks of this generation? He gave us the planet in this state. Salah. You want to know what God thinks of you? He lets you live during dark days. He must be going to ignite you in supernatural ways if he's called you to live in dark days. <clears throat> Says, uh, Abram, I want you to go down to Canaan. Abram gets to Canaan, finds a famine, goes to Egypt, sacrifices bridal identification, receives a miracle by God rescuing bridal identification, restoring intimacy back to Abram. And do you know what the Bible said Abram does? The Bible said Abram left from Egypt, went back up between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made his first altar. I hope somebody, it doesn't have to be 5,000 people, I hope somebody builds their first altar at something called the altar. In every stage of their life, they are able to cycle back around to a place of first love, fascination with Jesus that causes them to believe no degree of darkness is significant enough to extinguish the light. He goes back to Bethel, between Bethel and Ai, the place where he had built his altar, the Bible says, there at the first. Because you know what I think, friends? I think that there's stuff you and I believed for at the first. I think there's stuff we believed for at the beginning. I think there's stuff we believed for when this was all brand new and it was all fresh and it was fully alive in our heart. 
Before religion discipled us into complacency, before religion came and introduced us to an illegal concept called balance, till religion came and introduced us to a heresy called moderation. Bill Johnson, my primary man crush, Sam Elliott's in there too, just if you want to know. Okay, so. Bill Johnson. I'll keep waiting for him to walk in. If I say his name one more time, I can go sit down. <laughs> Bill Johnson says that says that, man, I'm like I can see him doing this. I'm weird that way, but he says balance by definition is an equal measure of a multiple of things. So what do you put on the other end of the scale if the kingdom of God is on one end of the scale to try to balance it out? I don't want American Christianity on the other end of the scale to balance out my kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I want the kingdom. When Noah, Noah says, curse be Canaan, Abram gets sent back down to Canaan. He stumbles off the path of believing God for anything. He, by grace, finds his way back onto the path of believing God for anything by recovering the altar he built at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Two groups of people here, those that are going to build their first altar and the others that are going to recover their first altar. <laughs> Angel of the church walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Says he who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands holds the seven stars in his hand. I know your labor, your patience, how you have borne Revelation 2, how you cannot bear those who do evil, how you have judged those that say they are apostles and you prove them to be liars, but I have somewhat against you that you left your first love. If an altar is a meeting place between God and man, could it be simple enough that the way you and I never leave first love is never forsake our first altar. Never forsake the place we meet with God. Man builds an altar, regenerates the planet. Curse comes into that which necessitates the building of a second altar. The man who builds the second altar's name is Abram. Stumbles off the path, comes back to the first altar. He builds between Bethel and Ai, and God changes his name to Abra. Abra. Where'd the whole mess start? Ham. He didn't just change his name. He said, if you'll reverse the curse, I'll give you back the forfeited identity that caused you to rule and reign in righteousness the way that you were designed for. I wonder if Fresno's not having a conference. She's getting her name changed this weekend. Reverse the curse in Jesus' name. What part of you that is fundamentally being identified this weekend as a worshiper, what part of you fundamentally being identified, make worshiper your core identification. 
To be to successfully stay in the core identification of worshiper, you'll have to be fully rooted in the revelation of beloved identity. Peter denies the Lord three times. According to Luke, after the third denial, he and Jesus lock eyes. After the third denial, he and Jesus lock eyes. He runs out in shame, tears streaming down his face. Adam transgresses the commandment of God. Watch this. Transgresses the commandment of God. As a result of that transgression, he hides himself from the Lord and covers himself with fig leaves. Peter denies the Lord face to face, locks eyes with the Lord face to face, and when he hears the rumor the tomb is empty, he runs toward the one Adam hid from. Gets to the tomb, of course, finds out the tomb is empty, John chapter 20. We move over into verse chapter 21, and we find that Peter has decided to go fishing. He's a leader, so people go with him even if he's not going the right direction. Jesus meets him even though he's moving in the wrong direction. Mercy endures forever. <laughs> when Jesus is cooking fish on the bank, Peter doesn't know it's the Lord, but the prophetic beloved identity inside of John can recognize him when nobody else can. Remember when he comes walking to him on the water, everybody thinks it's a ghost but John. Why? Because beloved identity is the only legal access to revelation. <clears throat> Anything else you learn, you learn through your head. The good stuff you learn by daring to believe he's fascinated with you. So you got to get, the reason God doesn't shout is because he prefers nearness over the acquisition of information. He could yell enough to get you to hear anything, but he doesn't just want you to hear it, he wants you close. So he sets himself to stay a little bit quieter than the quietest other voice in your life. So he doesn't have to drown out anything. Adam sins against God, eats a piece of fruit hides in the garden. Peter denies the Lord face to face, locks eyes with the Lord after denying him face to face, and when he finds out Jesus is alive, he runs and swims toward the one Adam hid from. What, listen to this thought, what did Peter know about the nature of God revealed in the person of Jesus that Adam did not? What did Peter know about the nature of God revealed in the person of Jesus that Adam did not? And more importantly in Fresno this morning, what did Peter know about the nature of God manifest in the person of Jesus that I do not? Because in my moments of weakness, I have a tendency to want to hide the parts of me that most need to be exposed to presence. Religion will teach you to hide the parts of yourself that can only be altered at the altar where God meets with man. So here, here's, I call this mercy's biathlon. Peter knows something about the nature of God made manifest in the person of Jesus. Why? Because Peter knew that Jesus did not just come so that when he died, he wouldn't have to go to hell. That's great news, by the way. But he knew that in him dwelled all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Show us the Father. How long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is the express image of the radiance and brilliance of Almighty God. Jesus did not come to be our get out of hell card. He came to fix our fractured and fragmented perspective over who the Father actually is. And listen, I, I believed incorrectly for years that if I could sufficiently and adequately lay my life down, I could earn his pleasure. And that thinking made me a hypocrite. What I need is more consecration and then he'll be fascinated with me, man. 
You know, what I need is to pray more and fast more and memorize more scriptures. You do know all those are really cool things. But for me, they were an attempt to leverage my way out of the idea that he was disappointed in me. You and I are called to lay our lives down, not to earn his pleasure, but that all of the grace necessary for the laid down life is present inside of the revelation that he is fascinated with me just like I am, not as I'm pretending to be. And we're, that's, that's too scandalous for some. Because we think it's going to keep people from the fear of judgment that creates good behavior. And the penal system proves to us fear of judgment doesn't create good behavior. Perfect love casts out all fear, for fear carries with it the anticipation of judgment. I'm telling you to access genuine biblical kingdom holiness you have to start with he's fascinated with me right now and if you do not believe that you will avoid the altar at any cost he wants you he wants to meet with you the problem is He'll only meet with the real you. I tried to get God to interact with pseudo me. Y'all get so quiet, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I was in here with all of Jesus' second cousins. Religion taught me to hide the parts of me that most needed exposure to presence. Abram was a flawed man, yet Yahweh called him righteous. And he turned the place of the curse into the place that is now principally and fundamentally called the promised land. What I feel to say today, I, I... the, these, these arenas are challenging for me because I am, as soon as I get done here, I'm going to run back to my little bitty white church in the woods that you could fit on this platform twice. I lead a little bitty tiny congregation of burning ones. And I refuse to call it little when a people are being given permission to find their way to the altar of the living God. I want a new definition of big. Big encounters, not big numbers. I want a new definition of success. Face to face, not performance. I'm going to get on a plane and I'm going to fly back to my super hot wife and my (laughs) tiny little white church in the woods with the steeple and the bell. Oh, the bell. (laughs) I couldn't fit the security team here in my church. (laughs) And I used to do events like this all the time and I am not coming out of retirement. I'm going right back to my little white church in the woods where Yahweh gave me an altar. And I'm going to meet him at that altar. And I don't want you to leave here with a t-shirt and a dream. I want you to leave here with an altar where face to face you meet with Almighty God all the days of your life. Come on. Life was, life was the light. Life was the light. Nikki, I don't know if you guys are supposed to come now. Somebody, where's my little, where's my little baby daughter at? Nikki, come on. 
It's my spiritual daughter. I love her. She's so tiny. It's destiny here too. It's destiny. Come on, destiny. Why don't you bring your whole band? I know it's lunchtime. And if you want to leave, bye. But I would stay here all day to see one person build a real altar in Fresno, California. Listen, listen. You have an experience and you get to listen to a preacher you're a fan of and a worship team you're a fan of. It won't take you very far. But if you go home and you, you build you an altar, if you'll go home and you'll build you an altar, we may be starting a revolution this weekend. We may be stepping into the next phase of a third great awakening. We may be moving, friends, toward the kingdoms of this world, becoming the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ. What if this is the next phase of what great men like Lou Engle have been burning to build for generations that dare to believe the knowledge of the glory of God really can cover the earth as the waters do cover the sea. And if we'll ask of Him, He'll give us nations as our inheritance. Don't leave with a t-shirt, leave with an altar. Don't leave with a bracelet, leave with an altar. Don't leave with a selfie, leave with an altar. I dared ask God today for a dozen people in this room that would build an actual altar. And I'm just gonna ask if you're one of those, you feel that stirring in you? Thank you. You feel that stirring in you? Come on. You feel that thing stirring in you? To say, I want to be one of those ones that says, for me, this is going to be so much more than an event. This is going to be my Bethel and my AI. This is going to be the place where I build my altar to the Lord. I need the guitar player and the drummer and the bassist. Come on, quick, 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 quick. Corey, I want you to get a microphone. I want you to come help me. Hola, my Come on, I want you as you come forward, even as we're waiting on the music, I want you to begin to just lift up a sound of hunger. There are people coming from all over this arena. I want you to make room. I want you to move forward, and I want you to release the cry of your heart. They're coming from all over. We're going to build an altar on a Saturday morning in Fresno, and we're going to start a revolution of devotion to Jesus. Come on. Come on, they're coming from all over. Just turn turn her up as much as you can, please. You're my deepest desire. Deepest desire. spirit of the fear of the Lord begin to move in this place right now. Lift your hands high. I want us to go into the holy, holy, holy song you were doing when Corey got up. I want you to lift your hands high all over this room. When you do that, lift your voice with your hands. Begin to let the cry of your heart come out of your mouth. Show. 
Sure. Come on, if there's hunger in you, if you want to find your way back to your first altar, begin to let the cry of hunger come out of your belly today. Lift those hands high to the Lord all over the room. You're holy. 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 Come on, tell him he's holy. Come on, tell him he's holy. Tell him he's holy. Tell him he's holy. Holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty who walks in here. 
finish the work. So let's stretch our hands. You agree with that? Stretch your hands high one more time, man. Don't miss this moment, friend. Don't let this be casual. This is holy, holy, holy. Woo! If you came here and got the message, if you have somehow gotten the message that this conference 